Thank you, Managing Director uh, Hakem. I appreciate the regular meetings we've had with MTA in an effort to avoid this very crisis. I'm asking you the same questions I've been asking for the past three and a half years, and I expect answers to all four of my questions in the next five minutes. Uh, first, the MTA use, currently uses measures of service uh, for quality called weight assessment, which, uh, if believed, says performance has remained flat uh, between 75 and 80 percent since 2012, while on-time performance has dropped from over 85 percent to just 66 percent. Will the MTA abandon the broken weight assessment and use new measures of excess wait time, multiplying the delay by the number of riders impacted, and excess journey time to account for the delay waiting on a platform and delays once on the train? We are actually looking right now at how to to report better to our customers what their experiences are, whether it's, as you're suggesting, platform wait time that is in excess or travel time or segments of, of travel trips and whether that is adhering to schedule. Um, right, well, everything needs to be reviewed right now because I think there is this recognition that the way we've been reporting um, stats don't really help our customers. Wow, thank you. On accessibility, the new 2nd Avenue subway only has one elevator at 86th Street and has already broken down, leaving my district without accessibility to the new line. Additionally, a new plan to add accessibility to 86th Street and Lexington again only provides one elevator that will only serve the local six uptown while ignoring the four and five express lanes. Will you pledge to provide more than one elevator for redundancy and 100% performance to serve all lines when building new stations or renovating existing stations? While I can't make a pledge of providing more than one elevator because everything needs to be looked at in the, the totality, not just isolated, I can, though, say that we are committed to better improving the maintenance, particularly at those, at those stations that you referred to, so that we don't suffer through uh, periods of elevators not being available. But even when they are, because nothing is, is perfect, uh, even yours truly, like, as long as we have some redundancy, we, there, there is that extra buffer. So if the MTA would adopt a policy or best practice moving forward of having more than one elevator, is that something you could evaluate? We, we, where it is feasible, and we showed that we did that at 63rd Street and other stations as part of 2nd Avenue. It's just, I, I can't say with a blanket statement that we would be able to do that everywhere. It's, it's disappointing, but I, I, again, think that anytime we're doing new construction or new renovation, that is an opportunity. Uh, we're moving right along, number three. I have high hopes for modern train control, but was disappointed to learn that the brand new 2nd Avenue subway was built without it, and upon inquiry, that even when it is upgraded, we would only get a headway of three minutes or 20 trains per hour on the CVTC. Yesterday, the New York Times reported that of the 90 trains scheduled for Grand Central from 8 a.m. to 9 a.m., only 77 showed up. Mm -hmm. First, please give me that data. Second, if the MTA actually ran the trains you're supposed to, is it possible we could actually address overcrowding? Moscow has a similarly aging infrastructure but has accomplished 90-second headways. What does Russia know that we don't? Can we reduce our headways to 90 seconds to add an additional 10 trains per hour, increasing capacity of our system by 25 percent using our existing technology? Try to get a subway in Moscow at 2 o'clock in the morning. They're closed. They so is it just night. that they have a maintenance period over the evenings? It's and a big contributor. Is there any limitation to our existing technology to having shorter head headways? It, it, there, there are a variety of issues. It's power, it's the, the configuration of the line, it's the ability to put the CBTC equipment on the cars, getting the right fleet in the right place. There are a variety of factors. But, but, but even the CBTC that we're evaluating is only 20 trains per hour while Moscow's at 40 and Singapore's at 40. How do we get to 40 trains per hour? I, I want to get back to you on the specifics of what those headway opportunities are on our CBTC equipped lines because my numbers are a little bit bigger than those. Oh, oh okay. Uh, my, my data source was Wikipedia on this. Yeah. Uh, and so uh, my, my fourth and final, and we'll continue to follow up, is the MTA has proposed cuts in bus service in Manhattan by as much as 33 percent claiming low ridership. Will the MTA stop cutting buses until the state of emergency is over and share fare box and bus track plan deviations from schedule so that we can turn around our buses and relieve pressure on the subways? 
just quickly, I will um, go back with our operations planning group to review what the bus service plans are for Manhattan. Um, and glad to have further conversation about that. And just to conclude, and I thank the chair for the extra time. Uh, in my, my wife is from Soviet Union. One of their phrases that Reagan made famous is trust but verify. Uh, MTA continues to say ridership is low, but you're not sharing the fare box data. And I need to see that. My constituents need to see that to see how it compares to real, real world scenarios. You share the fare box for the subway. We need it for the buses. There's a bus track system that your uh, dispatchers use to deviate buses from schedules. Mm -hmm. And if you could share both of those data sets, uh, we'd be able to not only trust, but we'd be able mm -hmm. to verify and work with you to improve the bus service. We actually do report bus fare box revenue, but we'd be glad to get more information to you. Thank you. Thank you. Council member.